We're going to be in the book of Ephesians this morning. Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to read verses 17 through 24. I wanted to, um, I wanted to start a, a series this morning on uh, mission and vision. And then I realized that um, it's going to be homecoming next week. I'll be in Guatemala the week after that and the week after that. So um, I had trouble trying to figure out where God would, um, would have me to be this morning. And I thought, you know, Nick started something. I'm going to follow him. So um, I'm going to follow behind exactly what he was doing and try to not add to or take anything away from what he was doing, but try to actually build on to the same foundation that he was laying. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. I thank you for standing if you have the means and are able. If you need to stay seated, I know that God understands. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. This is what it says. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanliness with greediness, But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard Him and have been taught by Him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. You can be seated. Let's go to Lord in prayer one more time. Father, I come to You right now, um, Lord, acknowledging my, um, my sinfulness. Father, a- acknowledging that, um, Lord, I know that um, I am not uh, correct in all of uh, my understanding. I know that, Father, that I am fallible. So, Father, I'm coming to You right now and I'm asking You to do this. God, I need Your Holy Spirit to do what He does, Father. I need Him to teach right now. And Father, I'm just praying that You just help help me to be able to get Your Word to the people that it needs to get to. I pray that it reaches me first and foremost. And then I pray that, uh, that whatever truth that it has to speak to these people here today, that You would cause it to do that. God, I... Um, I come to You just as humble as I know how because God, I know that I'm nothing without You. I know that my very next breath comes from You. And Father, I know that every step I take depends upon You and You providing it, God. So Father, I come to You claiming that right now and I'm just asking You to do what You do, God. And Father, we're just going to trust You by faith and we're going to follow You in this. And Father, I love You and I pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17 through 24, the Apostle Paul starts describing to us this process that should be taking place in our lives. And so what I want to talk to you about this morning is how to put on the new man. There is a new man that we are supposed to be putting on. Uh, As Nick was talking to you last week from Galatians, we are no longer to walk in the flesh, but we are to walk in the Spirit. And as long as we walk in the Spirit, then we don't fulfill the deeds of the flesh. It is a, a new walk that we are supposed to be following. And Paul puts it like this. He said, you're supposed to put off the old man and put on the new man. But now my question that I have to answer this morning is, how? How do we do that? Because the truth of the matter is, the old man is who we are. The new man is who we want to be. It's the same battle that Nick talked about last week from Romans chapter 7 where he said that battle is inside each and every one of us. I want to do what is good, but I don't know how. I can't find it. And then at the end of that thing, the Apostle Paul said, who's going to save me from this war that I'm in? And he said, praise God, Jesus Christ will save me from it. 
And the Apostle Paul is saying the same thing in Ephesians chapter 4 right here. He's telling us that there is a school of Jesus Christ. And that if we will pull up on the edge of our seat and we'll listen to what He teaches, then He will show us how to take off the old and to put on the new. Paul had just finished, I'm not going to go up and read it because most of you should know it very well, in Ephesians chapter 4 verses 11 through 16, that is where he describes the church and how God has, or Christ has put the church together. And he has put some people to put, be pastors and evangelists and teachers and all types of ministers in the church. And it was for the purpose of growing the body in Christ. And he tells us that we should be growing up into Christ who is the head of all things. As a matter of fact, in verse 15, I didn't, I didn't give him this one, but in Ephesians 4 verse 15, he tells us, "...but speaking the truth in love, may we grow up in, in all things into Him who is the head, Christ." from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which each part does its share, it causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So the church is designed in such a way that it teaches us how to become more and more Christ-like. It is His design. I know there are so many people that we want to try to get across and think that I can do this on my own or I don't have to go to church in order to do this or to uh, grow in Christ. And I would humbly take the Word of God and disagree with you. He has designed this body in such a way that it teaches us how to put off the old and how to put on the new. He has designed this body in such a way that it actually puts you in a place that you actually got to put it into practice. By yourself, it's easy to be all those things. By yourself, it's easy to put on all of Christ-like ways whenever you don't have to deal with other sinful human beings. But all of a sudden, when you have to deal with other sinful human beings, guess what's got to happen? Faith's got to be put into practice. Or it ain't genuine faith. One of the two. And so the Apostle Paul recognizes this, so he expounds on this a little bit. And in verse 17 he says, This I say therefore. In other words, because of the way the body is designed, because we are to be growing up if we are working together and every part's doing their share, because if the truth is being spoken in love, we should be becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. Because of that, I say this to you, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. If you are putting your faith into practice, and if you are actually putting into application the things that that Christ is teaching you through the church that He has put together, if the truth is being spoken in love and you're putting that into practice, then you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. He says here in verse 19 that these people have given themselves over to lewdness. In other words, an unbridled fleshly life. My question to you is, when you look at your life outside of the church, would you be able to say that basically it's unbridled? I do what I want. I say what I want. I follow whatever my heart desires. And if that is the case, then you walk no different than the rest of the Gentiles walk. There ought to be a bridle to your life. For those of you that know anything about horses, you know what a bridle does. A bridle actually controls that horse and actually it actually restrains that horse from doing things and just going wild however he wants to go. But instead, he says that these people have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanliness with greediness. And he says that they are past feeling in verse 19. In other words, he says that they don't have any shame about it. They can actually open their mouth and talk however they want to talk and they can walk however they want to walk and there's really no conviction there. There's really no uh, bad feeling or, or nothing wrong with the way that I see that I live my life. And the Apostle Paul says there's something wrong with that. He says there's an issue. And he says that the root of this problem, if we work our way backwards in verse 18, he says the root of this problem is that they have a hard 
heart in rebellion against God. They have a blindness in their heart and they have a blindness toward His ways. And it says that it is because of the ignorance that is in them. And this causes them to be alienated from the life of God because their understanding is darkened and it causes them at the end of verse 17 to walk in a futility of mind. Because there's ignorance of the ways of God, because there is a darkness of, uh, of the ways of God, because their heart is hard in rebellion against God, they walk in futility of their mind. Futility means it's worthless, it's useless, it's in vain. Everything they're doing and everything they're accomplishing in this life is going to be burned up and it's going to come to an end. And it will not accomplish anything. You know, my question to you is, what are you building in your life? With your walk and your daily routine, what are you building? Is it going to be burned up and be futile in the end? Is it going to be useless? Or is your daily walk actually a walk that is trying to build the kingdom of God? Trying to be the best example and the best reflection of Christ that you can be just so that in the end, whenever you stand before God, you won't be able to look at your life and go, you know, it was all wasted. But instead, you'll be able to look at your life and go, here are some things that you built that will last. No longer walk like the rest of the Gentiles walk. They are hard-hearted in rebellion and, and, and they are uh, hard-hearted toward the ways of God. They're ignorant and they, they don't understand because their understanding is darkened and their minds are futile and they're past feeling. But, in verse 20, or yeah, verse 20, but, he says, listen, you have not so learned Christ. In other words, if you are in the school of Christ, you've not learned this way. This is not the path that He teaches you. This is not the direction that He would have you go. But then Paul recognizes that maybe there are some people that are in the school of Christ that ain't serious about it. He realizes that maybe there are actually some people in the church that are listening that are not trying to take to heart the Word of God, that are not pulling up to the edge of their seat and saying, Christ, teach me more about your ways, but instead their desires are still on lewdness and the things of the world instead of what He is trying to deliver us from. So he says, you have not learned this way from Christ, until he gets to verse 24 or 21, he says, If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him. So he gives us two things there. He says, First off, you've not learned this way from Christ if you've actually heard him. There's some people who've not actually heard it yet. They've heard it, but they haven't heard. You ever, um, you ever heard uh, God tell the prophets in the Old Testament, he say, uh, Hearing, they don't hear. Having ears, they don't hear. In other words, you're preaching it, you're teaching it, you're doing it, and they're listening, but they don't hear it. And the Apostle Paul says there's people that are sitting in the school of Christ that are actually that away. They've not actually heard Him yet. They hear it, but they don't hear it. And he says maybe, and next he says, um, if indeed you have heard Him and have been taught by Him, as the truth is in Jesus. In other words, maybe you are hearing, but maybe you ain't pulling up to the edge of your seat and actually learning the truth from Him. Maybe instead you've got satisfied with where you're at. I've been there. I've been there. Satisfied. I'm okay with where I'm at. I'm not worried about learning anymore. I'm not worried about trying to put on any more of Jesus Christ. I'm good where I'm at. So instead of pulling up and, and sitting on the edge and actually trying to pick up everything that I can in the school of Christ, maybe I'm not doing that. And then he shows us exactly what Jesus Christ is teaching in verse 22. He says, here's what he's saying and here's what he's teaching, just in case you haven't heard it and just in case you're not learning from him. In verse 22 he says that you should put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. In other words, there should be a process in your life. You are to be seeing some things that are being put off. 
Now, I'm not saying you're perfect. I'm not. I'm not saying that you're going to have it all the way together. But I am saying that if you can't look at your life and see a process of things that are coming off, and you can't see a process of things that are being put on, then you need to question whether or not you've actually ever enrolled in the school of Jesus Christ. He says here that this process also includes, in verse 23, that we be renewed in the spirit of our mind. Remember, we're walking once in the futility of our mind. We're walking once in a darkness of understanding. We're walking once in ignorance of our heart and in basically unbelief. But he says we need to be renewed in the spirit of our mind and this will allow us, verse 24, to put on the new man. And before I go much further in that, I want to tell you, I was ministering to a guy one time and um, he he, he had this issue that he just couldn't seem to put it down. Uh, He knew it was wrong. He knew God was telling him this is something that don't belong in your life. He knew that God was telling him, this is something that if you're going to continue in my school, you've got to get a hold of this. You've got, this is something that I'm working with you on. You need to change it. And he fought with it and he fought with it. And then one day, he came to me and he had made up his mind that you know what, this is just the way that I am. It's just the way I am. It's not something that I can beat. It's not something I can, I can put off. It's not something that I can get control of. It's just who I am. And my question is, is that true? Is it true? Is it just who you are? Are there going to be certain things in your life that God will point out to you in the school of Christ that He'll look at you and say, you know what, it's okay, it's just who you are. No, it's not. He tells us that if we are renewed in the spirit of our mind, that we put on a new man. So the question we have to ask ourselves is how do we put on this new man? And the first clue comes from the second part of verse 24. He says that you put on the new man, which was what? Created. This new man is a creation. It's not something that you are. It's not something that you were born with. It's something that God is actually creating inside of you and it happens by God and by the power of His Holy Spirit according to your faith. So one of the first points that I want you to get across this morning on how this new man is created is this. If you're taking notes. It is created by God. And it is created by His power according to our faith. Now, I'm going to explain all that so you understand it. Look with me, if you would, at the book of Titus, chapter 3, verse 1 through 8. Titus, chapter 3, verse 1 through 8. He says, Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. So he's talking about this putting on process, right? He's assuming that they're already putting off these other things in order to put these things on. And then he tells them why they need to do this in verse 3. He says, For we ourselves were also once foolish. In other words, you used to walk like the rest of the Gentiles walked, right? He says, For we ourselves were once also foolish, disobedient, we were deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures. Anybody remember that? Living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But then I love verse 4. But when the kindness and love of God toward man appeared. He says, when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, what happened? He saved us. In other words, he's telling you this. The way this new man was created first and foremost, it began by the kindness of God. It wasn't something you deserved. It wasn't something that you were going to be able to do good in your life and be able to uh, merit this, this kindness of God. It was just His grace. And you know, the bigger God is to you, the bigger view you have of God, 
the greater this is to you. I remember um, David actually said in the Psalms, he said, what is man that you are mindful of him? He said, you have made the galaxies with your finger. The galaxies, all of space, all of creation. He said, you, you made it with, with your finger. You spoke the world into motion. You said, let there be, and what happened? There was. You took some dust out of the earth and you molded it together and you made me. You did this, and yet you saw fit when I was once foolish, when I was once disobedient, when I was once deceived, when I served other lusts and pleasures, when I lived in malice or hate and envy, and I was hateful and hating one another, you were kind to me. (laughs) The greater your view of God is, the more this is an amazing thing to you and the more you'll be able to say with David, who am I? Who am I that you were kind to? To me. So the first thing you need to realize is that it was the kindness of God. It was by grace, and it was not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but it was according to His mercy, He saved us. I want to show you a little bit more of this, of how this looks in Romans chapter 4, because the Apostle Paul gives us examples of this all over. In Romans chapter 4, verse 1, he says, What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? In other words, can we say that Abraham has received any of the kindness of God or any of the grace of God because he deserved it or because of any merit on his part? And then he says in verse 2, For if Abraham was justified by the flesh or by the works of the flesh, then he has something to boast about, but not before God. I say to you that, listen, this new man is created by the kindness of God. It is by His grace. And it is by your faith in His grace. And it has to be that way. It can't be by your works. It can't be by the good things that you do. Because if it is, then you've got something to boast about. And that is pride. And pride is the very thing that brought us down to begin with. Pride is the thing that said, God, I no longer need you to decide good and evil for me. I'll take from the tree even though you commanded me not to, and I will decide for myself what is good and what is bad. And that's pride. That says, God, we don't need you anymore. Appreciate you being there. I'll call you when I need you. For this, I'm good. And he says to us, listen, we've got to get this thing turned around. You're dust. You've forgotten that. You've forgotten that the very life that is in you comes from the breath that He gives. And if we will remember that, then we turn this thing around. And it says in verse 3 of Romans chapter 4, For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. In other words, you've lived long enough in the flesh. He created you to live for Him. Now, your works are not counted as grace, but instead, they're counted as debt. They're counted as the fact that He created you for good works in Him. And then we have took advantage of that. We have took advantage of that. You okay? (laughs) Braden, Braden got the best of her. Oh, he's gone. (laughs) <laughs> we got him he's captured maybe yeah do what? yeah he says now to him who works the wages are not counted as grace but as debt It is what He created us to be. And you've heard me say many times, we get it twisted. We get created and we start thinking that we were created to live for us. It's about me. And it's about what I want. It's about my desires. And God says, no, it's not. I created you for my glory. I created you to enjoy my creation, but I created you to do good works in me. 
and live for me. And then we go on and see this further in Romans chapter 4 over in verse uh, 19. If you want to go over to verse 19 with me, look what it, how he explains it further. He says, Abraham, not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about a hundred years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised, here's the key part, he was also able to perform and therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. So it was by the kindness of God or by grace that this new man is created. So first off, he wipes the slate clean, right? He gives you the opportunity to now quit living for you and live for Him. But then that word and that promise has to be mixed with faith. There are many people who hear that promise, but the difference, in, and He shows us the difference in Abraham. It says that he was not weak in faith and he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving all the glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. And that is how the new man is first created in you. It is by the kindness of God. It is by the grace of God. It is not by your works lest you should be able to boast. It can't be by your works because all the glory must go to God. And then the way that faith works into this, so again, I told you that it's created by God and His power according to our faith. It says that He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but instead He says that He was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and He was fully convinced that what He had promised He was also able to perform. And my question to you is this, do you believe that what God promises He is also able to perform? And if you do, and you don't waver with unbelief. I had a man call me this week and uh, God was just doing a great work in his life. And, and he was trying to figure out, you know, uh, I just want to make sure that I'm doing right. And I want to make sure that, that, that I'm right with Him. And I want to make sure that I'm living the way that I should. And I tried to explain to him this very thing right here. It's about being fully convinced that what he promised he is also able to perform. And what that causes us to do is rise up and walk in what He commands. So if He tells us to put on the new man, you know what we do? We, full, we are fully convinced that what He tells us to do, He is able to do. And it says here in verse 22, and therefore it was accounted to Him for what? Righteousness. So how is the new man created? It's created by God. It is created it's not something that you can naturally do. It is a creation of God. And it is created by His power, His grace, His kindness, His goodness. And it is according to your faith. If you are fully convinced in your heart and in your mind that what He has commanded, He also has the power to do, then you will rise up and you will walk in it and you will begin to put off and you will begin to put on if your faith is genuine. But I say to you this morning, if your faith is not genuine, then you'll be like the lame, you'll be like a lame man. That lame man had two choices. Jesus told him, rise up and walk. He had two choices. He could either be fully convinced that what he spoke, he also had the power to do, or he could look at himself and say, I'm sorry, I can't do that. And he could have stayed lame. You got two choices this morning. You can either hear the command for God to say, put off the old and put on the new and believe with all of your heart that He who commanded also has the power to bring it to pass. And you can rise up and walk in it. Or you can choose that I can't. I'm sorry. I appreciate you trying. And you'll either prove that you were fully convinced or your faith was not genuine. Does that make sense? The new man is created by God. I cannot get that across to you enough. It's not something that you do in your power. It's something that you do because you believe with all of your heart that He who commanded it 
has the power to bring it to pass in your life. I'll finish with one last thing. The new man is created according, going back to uh, hold your place in Titus and go back to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4 again. <clears throat> Notice what he said in verse 23. He said, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Man, our minds are the problem, ain't they? Our minds are a mess. Our minds can throw us loops that we can't even imagine until we're there. And he says here that we must be renewed in the spirit of our mind. He tells us in Titus chapter 3, verse um, 5, he says, it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but it was according to His mercy He saved us, and it was through the washing of regeneration or the cleansing of our mind for the better and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. The washing of regeneration is just another way of saying we're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. That's what the washing of regeneration means. And he says that we have to be renewed in the spirit of our mind, and this renewing comes from the Holy Spirit. Look at John chapter 14, verse 26. In John chapter 14, verse 26, we actually have Jesus commanding and telling us that the Holy Spirit is going to come and He is going to help us. The Father is going to send Him. He's going to teach you all things. And look what He's going to do. He's going to bring to remembrance all things that Jesus said to you. In other words, He's going to teach you in the school of Christ. He is going to renew your mind. He's going to clean up the things that are in there that are debased. You know from Romans chapter 1, verse 28, that because we did not want to retain the knowledge of God, we instead have been given over to debased minds to do those things which are not fitting. So the book of Romans tells us that the problem is our minds. We have chosen to go our own way, our own path, and our minds have been corrupted. And y'all ought to know this from your own experience and your own life. And he tells us that we have to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. So that's the reason why he tells us in Romans chapter 12, you should know this scripture very easily. He says, do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by what? So that you may know what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of mind. Uh, uh, of God. Our minds must be renewed. And we are told this in Romans 1, in Romans 12, in Ephesians 4, in Titus 3. But how? Last scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15 through 18. He says, But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now before you change Scriptures right there, you understand this. <clears throat> before Christ came, all we had was the law, right? We had the Ten Commandments. So when you looked at the Ten Commandments, you could see a glimpse of God, but it was like looking at who God is through a veil. But nevertheless, when one turns to Jesus Christ, the veil is taken away. Now go to verse 17. <coughs> he says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. But we all with an unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. What are we looking at with an unveiled face? The Lord. Jesus Christ. We're not looking at the law. We're looking at the example of Jesus Christ. We're looking at His life and we're gazing upon His perfections and everything that He is. And He says that we are beholding as if we're looking at a mirror. Not through a veil. We're seeing a direct reflection when we look at Jesus Christ of the glory of God. And it says that we are being transformed into the same image from glory to to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. As the Holy Spirit shows us and brings to remembrance all the things of Jesus Christ, 
as He teaches us everything that Jesus said, and He reminds us of all the teachings of Jesus Christ, it says here that that Spirit shows us that image and then transforms us into that image from glory to glory. You know what that means? <clears throat> that means that I may be at one glory today, but He's going to bring me to another level tomorrow and another level tomorrow and another level tomorrow. And more and more, He is going to transform me into this direct image as looking in a mirror into the glory of the Lord. And it happens by the Holy Spirit. So I say again, how is the new man created? Number two, by the renewing of the mind and the power of the Holy Spirit. By listening and learning and gazing upon the ways of Jesus Christ, and not being in rebellion to it, but trusting the power of the Holy Spirit to transform you into that same image as He teaches you and shows you Jesus Christ. And from one glory to the next glory, there is a process of putting off and there is a process of putting on. And you should be able to see this process in your life. Now, let's reread the last time, Ephesians chapter 4. With all that knowledge, if you can retain all of it. Let's reread Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 17. <clears throat> this I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. You see that? They have corrupted minds, debased minds. Their understanding is darkened. They are alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in them. In other words, they don't have the knowledge of Christ. They don't have the Holy Spirit transforming them into the same image. And it is because of the blindness of their heart. Their heart is hard and in rebellion against God. They don't want it. And he says, their past feeling and they have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanliness with greediness, but you have not so learned Christ if, if indeed you have heard Him and have been taught by Him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to those deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which was what? Created not by your works of righteousness. It was created by the kindness of God according to your faith. Being fully convinced that what He has commanded, He is also able to perform. And therefore, it is accounted unto you for righteousness. It is created according to God in true righteousness and in holiness. So what does this look like lived out? Verse 25, Therefore, Therefore, because you're in the school of Christ, because you are being created new, because you are by faith putting off and putting on, therefore put away lying. Let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. Be angry, but don't sin. In other words, there's a time for angry, but don't let it lead you into sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. How many of us are guilty of that? nor give place to the devil. When we do let the sun go down on our wrath, we're just giving the devil a place to get back in and start putting back on the old that we're trying to put off. Verse 28, Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give to him who has need. And let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is the one doing the transformation. The Holy Spirit is the one that is showing you what needs to be put off and showing you what needs to be put on. How many of you have felt and known that this is something that don't belong in my life and you know that it's not right and yet instead of listening and responding, you grieve Him? He says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another. He's, you see this process of putting off and putting on? 
And it all happens by the power of the Holy Spirit, by gazing at Jesus Christ and by allowing Him to transform you from one glory to to another glory. He says, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. And finally, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. Finally, imitate what you see. Finally, take the faith that you have. Are you fully convinced that what He is commanding you to do He is also able to perform it in you. He took the example of Abraham and he said, Abraham was a hundred years old when God promised him, I'm going to give you a son. You're going to be the father of many nations and he's a hundred years old. And he says he didn't even consider that he was a hundred years old. He didn't even think about the fact that Sarah's womb was dead. But instead, being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform, he trusted him and by faith, he received the promise of God. You want to put on the new man? You want to put off the old and put on the new? It's only going to happen by faith in the power of God. By faith in gazing upon Jesus, trusting in the Holy Spirit. Pull your seat up as close as you can. Don't be like Martha said on the back row, you backsliders. Get up there on the front row and say, Holy Spirit, show me a little more. Give me a little more. Show me something else that I can put off and I can put on and transform me by my faith, according to my faith, by Your power, transform me into that same image from one glory to another glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. That's what you ought to see taking place in your life. Not perfection, but a transformation. If y'all would, stand. We're just going to have a word of invitation this morning. As our band comes, I'm just going to pray. And however the Lord sees fit to uh, work with you this morning, if it's something you'd like to humble yourself in the altar about, um, pray to Him for, ask Him for, whatever the case may be. That's this time and that's what it's for. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank You this morning for Your Word. I thank You that You have left us this uh, inspired reading for us to be able to see the image of Jesus Christ, to see the reflection of Your glory. Father, I thank You that our, our new man is not by our works, but I thank You that it is created by You according to our faith. And Father, thank You for allowing us to be able to give You all the glory for everything that's done in our lives. We can't take credit for any of it, and I thank You for that. Father, I pray this morning that each and every one of us would be able to look at our lives and see genuine faith. Be able to see that we hear Your Word and that we are fully convinced that what You are commanding us, You are also able to perform. And I pray that You help us to rise up and walk in it. Father, I just thank You for Your mercy. I thank You for that kindness. <laughs> who, who am I that You are mindful of me? But Father, thank You for that. And Father, I just I ask that You work among Your people right now with however You see fit. We love You. We thank You. In Jesus' name, Amen. <laughs>
alone. Nobody else. It's him. basically got me through Can the last several months. My Listen to it closely. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. Through it all, through it all, it is well. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. And it is well.
Oh